32. Inheritance and Dominion As we have seen, in biblical law, the firstborn gains a double portion of the estate, but also assumes a like share of the debts as well as the care of the parents and family leadership. The modern state has in effect declared itself to be the firstborn of every family and claims, by means of inheritance taxes, the rights to often far more than a double portion, a prior right to the inheritance, and, by means of welfareism, it assumes support of the parents if the survivor is needy. The state does not assume any of the family's debt. The state thus claims to be the family of man to a greater degree than the medieval church once asserted. In the family under God, the eldest son, unless disinherited, receives, as we have noted, a double portion, and all other sons, unless disinherited, receive equal portions. There is thus a principle of equality for all godly sons. The state, as the firstborn, increasingly asserts its absolute priority as an heir to every estate and declares that a rigid principle of equality must apply to all members of the family of man. The premise of such status thinking is a modern egalitarian philosophy which has been well expressed by Josiah Wedgwood in The Economics of Inheritance. The philosophy of this work, first published in 1929, is basic to the great decline of Britain. According to Wedgwood in his introduction to the 1938 edition, In the new age of uncharitable faiths, the liberal economic method remains dispassionate and agnostic. Agnostic in all but one respect. Those who employ that method need not affirm a wholesale belief in utilitarian philosophy, but they must not throw away the baby with the bathwater. They must accept, in theory at least, the idea, inherent in all the great philosophies, and not least in the ethics of Christianity, that the welfare of all human beings, irrespective of race, class, creed or colour, is of equal importance in the sight of God and should be in the minds of men. Ten years ago, it was not absurd optimism to assume that belief formed a common basis underlying free discussion of social problems. An age seems to have passed since then, but anyone who takes the trouble to do any research on social and economic questions must still try to believe with Plato and the Stoics that no soul willfully misses truth. Despite this statement, Wedgwood is anything but dispassionate and emphatically not an agnostic with respect to statist humanism. Moreover, the Bible does not affirm the ideas of equality. Wedgwood knows full well that the ethics of Christianity mean the Bible and its law and biblical ideas of inheritance cannot be equated with his passionate equalitarianism. Again, to believe with Plato and the Stoics that no soul willfully misses the truth is an amazing faith as well as a denial of man's depravity and sin. Wedgwood has willfully missed the truth about the Bible and about himself Biblical law requires us to deal differently with 1. Our family 2. Our brethren in the faith and 3. The rest of men All are to be dealt with in that love which is a fulfilling of the law but we cannot love our neighbour's wife as we do our own without sin Love does not mean equality and godly law does not mean the equality of good and evil it is intellectual suicide to reduce all things to equality, 
or to insist on equality as the common denominator with either God or man. God, after all, is a maker of both heaven and hell. Wedgwood cited Edwin Cannon against any correlation of income with work or service and in favour of an equality of income based on need. According to Cannon, Income according to service is almost obviously a hopelessly rotten ideal since it means nothing for those who, temporarily or permanently, cannot serve at all. And these, in many cases, are the very people whose needs are greatest. I have never swerved from the advocacy of the nearest possible approximation to distribution according to need and have always looked on distribution according to service as a chimera and an undesirable chimera. This is, of course, the Marxist principle, but it is common in varying forms to all humanists. The equality of the new godhead, mankind, is thereby asserted, and in any theology, humanist or biblical, the equal ultimacy of all persons in the godhead is a theological and philosophical necessity. The state, as the firstborn, has the prerogative of enforcing this equality on all so that society can be freed from subordinationism. Practically, this means moving against the inheritance of wealth by gifts, succession and marriage. Wedgwood is aware that all men are not born equal and that they have inborn differences which are determined by differences in their ancestry. However, what nature or God has done, he is determined to undo and mend by statist action. The goal is an equalitarian society. Now, Scripture gives no justification for an equalitarian order and it also gives no ground whatsoever for an elitist order. Only a godly order established in terms of biblical law is tenable in terms of scripture. Elitism and equalitarianism are alike humanistic. They move in terms of man and man's hopes. The Bible is heedless of either philosophy. Scripture requires a God-centred society, one in which God's law militates against equalitarian and elitist goals. Both equalitarianism and elitism are in essence contemptuous of man in the name of man. The elitist despises the majority of men and the equalitarian despises all able and independent men, but in essence Both despise all men as men and love rather their idea of men, not man himself in the singular. Inheritance in the Bible is theocentric. A word frequently used in Hebrew for inheritance is chalek, a portion or a providential bestowment. An inheritance is in essence from God and to be governed by his law. God, as the Creator, designed the earth for the use of His people. Man is to hold land, cultivate it, and enjoy it. Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 following, Psalm 105, verse 16, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 9. This is God's avowed purpose. Man, having fallen into sin, God began to plan the dispossession of the earth by fallen man in favour of covenant man. As a result, God promised a portion of the earth, Canaan, for Abraham's seed. When the Hebrews became numerous, God gave them Canaan as their portion. To prevent the return of God's earth to ungodly hands, God forbade the alienation of farmland by seal the earth being the Lord's, it could not be transferred to any but covenantal kin. If Israel became apostate, God declared that he himself would dispossess them. Deuteronomy chapter 28, 
verses 63 to 68. The purpose of the non-transference law was thus to safeguard the land in the hands of covenant man, who would himself train up a godly seed to continue the use of the earth in the hands of God's agent. The goal was and is the possession of all things by covenant men. In Canaan, however, being surrounded by covenant breakers outside the land and Canaanites within, as well as covenant-breaking Israelites, godly men were restricted in the disposition of the earth. How seriously Scripture requires godliness to take priority over all other considerations in inheritance appears in a strongly stressed case, that of Othniel and his wife Akash, daughter of Caleb. Caleb passed over his sons to make his daughter Akash and his son-in-law Othniel his central heir. Joshua chapter 15, verses 16 to 19. Judges chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. Caleb and Othniel were in the covenant people by faith rather than by blood, and the priority of faith was set forth over blood and sex. An inheritance could be divided during the lifetime of the father, and the prodigal son so requested it, and it was accordingly given to him. At the time, his prodigality was not yet apparent. Luke chapter 15, verse 12. The purpose of an inheritance is a portion or a providential blessing which will enable the godly to extend their dominion over the earth. There is thus of necessity a required inequality of inheritance because there is a required moral division among men and a religious division. God's law requires that the godly seed be blessed and the ungodly set aside. Rebecca was thus religiously and righteously concerned when her husband Isaac showed every intention of making an heir, and the central heir of an ungodly son, Esau, who despised the inheritance of faith and was casual about the material inheritance. The essential alienation of an inheritance is its transmission to ungodly or to irresponsible hands. A portion, or a providential bestowment, should be the lot only of the righteous. It is thus unrighteousness to transmit an inheritance to the ungodly, whether bloodkin or not. Scripture gives us some very revealing usages of the word chelek, or providential bestowment. In Psalm 16, verse 5, David declares, The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance, and of my cup, thou maintainest my lot. In Psalm 73, verse 26, Asaph declares, My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. More than land and gold, our greatest and essential portion or inheritance is the Lord. In the Song of Moses, however, this same word is used in a startling sense. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 9. The meaning is clearly set forth by C. H. Waller. He chose Israel for his own portion, that through them he might inherit the world. God's people are his inheritance through whom he purposes to recapture the world and to exercise direct and full dominion according to his law. No inheritance can be separated from this purpose without sin. It is clear, too, why statist intervention into matters of inheritance is so demonic. Such intervention enthrones the disinheritance of God into law. 
It strikes at the whole purpose of succession and dominion, and, as Cannon so malevolently affirmed, it sets aside service in favour of need, need as humanistically defined. Inheritance taxes are, in essence, anti-Christian, and every legitimate means should be used to avoid them. The goal of occultism, atheism and unbelief is the inheritance and possession of the earth and power without God and in defiance of him. The goal of covenant man is the inheritance and possession of the earth and power and dominion over the earth under God and according to his law. When God struck down the firstborn of Egypt in the tenth plague, he thereby destroyed the airship of apostate man by declaring Israel to be his firstborn, to be delivered from Egypt, he affirmed the airship of covenant man to the earth. A godly law order will work to disinherit, execute and supplant the ungodly and to confirm the godly in their inheritance. For Christians to work for anything less is to deny God.